Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Stuart Sierra. I work for Cognitect, and I'm here to talk about closure. This will be a little bit more of an intermediate talk. I am going to show a lot of closure code on the example slides. Uh, you won't necessarily need to be able to read all of that in order to understand what's going on, but it might be helpful. If you were at my uh, intro to closure talk yesterday, you should have gotten just enough of the syntax for everything that I'm going to show here. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to help. So I want to talk about diamonds and mud. There is a quotation that I've encountered at various times in my programming career, uh, talking about the programming language APL. And I don't know how many of you have used APL, I have not, but it's that language with the funny symbols and the squiggles that looks like old high Gallifreyan. And uh, this guy, Joel Moses, reportedly said that APL is like a beautiful diamond. It is a perfect language, but it is also a very unmodifiable language. Once you've, you have it, but you can't add anything new to it. And the continuation of this uh, quotation is that Lisp, which was around at the same time, is a big ball of mud. And you can add anything you want to it, but it's still going to be a ball of mud. Now, there is some uh, dispute as to whether this guy, Joel Moses, actually said this. Uh, there is also uh, some confusion as to whether this part of the statement was meant as disparagement or a compliment of Lisp. You could look at it one way and say, well, this is bad because Lisp is always a big ball of mud and no matter how much you do to it, no matter what structure you try to add, you're still going to have a ball of mud when you're done. But you could also look at this as a positive description of Lisp. It could say that Lisp is infinitely malleable and you can do with the language whatever you want to do and anything you add to it is going to retain the same fundamental structure of the language. Fortunately for us in these more modern times we have uh, design patterns and formal studies of design patterns including the big ball of mud. Uh, this was described in an article by Brian Foote and Joseph Yoder some years ago. And they said a big ball of mud is a haphazardly structured piece of spaghetti code. Systems like this show unmistakable signs of unregulated growth and repeated expedient repair. Who's ever worked on a system that ended up like that? Yes, yes, I thought so. So this just happens, you know, like we, it seems to be unavoidable that systems just grow and they get more complex and these things happen. But uh, in this article, they go on to actually enumerate characteristics of these systems. And one of the key ones is that information tends to be shared promiscuously, their word, in every part of the system to the point where nearly all the important information is either global or duplicated. And this is a very important point. This is probably one of the things that makes these big ball of mud systems so difficult to work with, is that everything can potentially influence everything else. So as I've worked as uh, a consultant at Cognitect on closure programs of our own, and also more recently going into businesses that have closure applications and working with them, I've noticed certain patterns that don't work out well for closure programs. And I think they mostly stem from the fact that the language itself does not provide a lot of built-in structure. Now, in many ways, this is a virtue. The language is very flexible. You can structure your application however you want. You are not tied into the paradigm of classes and objects. On the other hand, with classes and objects, at least you sort of knew where things were supposed to go. An object-oriented language has this built-in structure. It has a place to put state, and a place to put a constructor, and a place to put the behavior that operates on that state, and so forth. That is a useful feature of object-oriented programming. So when we start learning closure, and when we start writing closure apps, 
there's certain things that we might realize that are unfamiliar or we don't know where to put things. One of the first places is namespaces. One of the commonest questions I get when I'm teaching Clojure or introducing people to Clojure is, how do you structure a program into namespaces? And namespaces are really very limited. They're just names. People try to use them like classes or like modules, but that doesn't really work because they aren't. They aren't really first class entities in your program. You can inspect them and manipulate them, but you don't pass them around to other parts of your program. They're also not parameterized the way modules are in some other languages. So you can't have one module that has a relationship to another module that you could change at runtime. You could give it a different implementation of that module. Another thing we discover very quickly about Clojure is that almost everything is global by default. If you're creating something in an object-oriented language, you're creating a class. So it's sort of automatically encapsulated inside the class, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But with Clojure, the first thing we learn how to do is def stuff. So if we need something, the thing we're going to do is probably def it. And that applies to functions, but sometimes it also ends up applying to state, things like atoms and refs that hold the state in our application. So these things are not necessarily a problem with small applications. When you're starting out, when you're learning, or when you're working on small, simple apps, this isn't really going to get in your way. But I've seen applications that grow much, much larger. I've walked into companies that had 10,000 lines or more of closure code. And if you think of how succinct and expressive Clojure is, that's probably something like a million lines worth of Java or an equivalent language. Also, these programs tend to be larger systems involving multiple machines, maybe dozens or even in some cases hundreds of different machines. And as a result, it takes more than one or two people to develop them. They need larger teams, teams that work on different parts of the system. So uh, to try to deal with this problem, how to work with larger systems in a coherent way, I found it actually useful to go back to some of the literature on object-oriented software patterns and software architecture, including uh, one of my favorite books. This is a series called Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture. And most of this literature is all oriented towards you know, heavyweight object-oriented languages like Java and C++. But once you look past that and get to the concepts, a lot of them still apply. A lot of them make a lot of sense, including, I think, this most important idea, which is what I'm going to talk about today, this idea of separating your program into components. Is there a question here? Um, okay, so you're asking what uh, types of applications or what types of industries do these tend to show up in. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I mean, Clojure is a general purpose language. So I've seen these systems in everything from uh, retail to, uh, you know, uh, operations analytics. So really it can apply anywhere. And these techniques apply anywhere as well, I think. So a component is basically a few simple ideas. It has these characteristics. And I took these from some of the literature about software architecture. And in particular, I want to talk about these three things. And I'm going to give very specific definitions for what I mean by these. Encapsulated state, interfaces, and a life cycle. So I'm going to start with encapsulation. And by encapsulation, I mean something very specific. I mean this definition here. Encapsulation is about grouping and separating. It's about putting things together that are related and need to be handled together, and separating things that are not related, that do not need to affect one another. Notice I am not talking about data hiding. I am not talking about 
hiding an implementation or private fields or some of the other things that also get lumped under this term. All I'm talking about is grouping and separation. So here's the first problem that I encounter. This is something that ends up in a lot of closure apps when we don't know what else to do. We need some state. Maybe it's a connection to some resource, like a database. Maybe it's some internal piece of state in memory, like an in-memory cache. And we need to put it somewhere. So what do we do? Well, we def it, because that's what we know how to do. And then we write functions that refer to those things that we've def. We've, they refer back to those symbols. This might be all in one namespace that's doing some data access for some user database. So what's the problem with this? What are those defs up there? They're global mutable variables. The past 60, 70 odd years of software engineering have been trying to get away from global mutable state. And the first thing we do when we have a new language is put the global state back in there. And it's hard to resist, and I'll show you why. But the thing is, as soon as we do this, now we're back in the problem that we had you know, back with before structured programming, where everything was just globally accessible in memory. The problem with having these be global is that as soon as they're global, there's a temptation to share them everywhere. If something needs to refer to that database, well, obviously, it just needs to refer to that var. It doesn't need to go through any other interface to do that. Another downside to this is that by creating these things as defs, we've essentially written ourselves into a corner by saying there can only ever be one of these things. Anything you def is, by definition, a singleton. So there can only be one of these. If we wanted different database connections or more than one database connection, we'd have to def something else. We'd have to add new stuff. We couldn't just alter, swap in an alternate implementation of this, at least not easily. The deeper problem, though, is that now we have this global bit of state, and we have things that depend on that state but it's hidden from us. A public function in some other namespace might call one of these public functions that are in this namespace, not realizing that they depend on that global state. It's not obvious. So this global state, even if we don't refer to those vars directly elsewhere in our program, we have implicitly infected every piece of our program with global state if it calls one of these functions anywhere in its call stack. So what are the downsides to this? Well, one of the first ones that comes up is that it is harder to, do the, harder to test these things. In order to test something that uses some global mutable state, you have to wrap all of your tests in code that's going to explicitly set up and tear down the state when you're done. And it's very easy to forget some detail about this. Remember, those functions we called don't necessarily make it obvious that they're depending on that state. And maybe the function that depends on the state is actually three or four layers deep in the call stack from the function that we're trying to test. How do we know that we need to set up those mutable variables in order to run the test? It's very easy to forget about that. Furthermore, it's easy to make a mistake and have tests suddenly start influencing each other. If two different tests are using something that depends on that global state, one of them might do something that causes the other test to appear to pass when it shouldn't, or to appear to fail when it shouldn't. Suddenly, the tests can interfere with each other. Another problem with this, particularly if you like doing interactive development, is that as soon as you reload a namespace, containing these definitions, whether you do it you know, by pressing some key in your editor or your IDE, or just typing require reload at the REPL, you recreate that namespace and you, you destroy whatever state might have accumulated in those mutable variables. So you might say, well, I'm, I can work around that. I can use def once. This is a feature built into Clojure that will not redefine a var if it already exists. This makes it slightly safer to reload your code. But now you have another problem. Now you have no way of recovering the initial state of those variables. If you are developing an application 
at the REPL and working with an editor that knows how to reload code. You might be working away and changing things and modifying state and interacting with your application. And then you change something. But now the thing you've changed in the code no longer reflects the state of your application in memory. So it's entirely possible and actually quite easy to get yourself into a state where the current state of your application in memory could not have been produced by the code that you have in your source files. This leads to a problem that people run into often enough is that you're developing on an app, you make some feature, you get it working, you get it tested, you get it running, you're done, you go home, come back the next day, restart your REPL, and all your tests fail. That can happen because the state that you were interacting with was not in sync with the source code that you were writing. So another way I've seen people try to work around this is by hiding the state. They say, you know what, okay, that state, I don't want it to be global, and I want to make sure that nothing else can refer to it. Even if I make it private, someone could still get at it. I want to make sure it's totally isolated. So they'll hide it in a closure like this. Turns out this really isn't any different. This is still global state. It merely happens to be hidden. These functions are closing over that ref and that atom, but they are still having a global, they still have global state. We haven't really changed anything. In fact, in some ways this is even worse because we can't even look at that state. We can't inspect it in the REPL. We can't use it to debug stuff. So instead, what I try to do and what I encourage people to do is try to shift from using global state to using only local state in all of your functions. If we need to create two things that are related, say a ref and an atom as before, or here just a ref and uh, an empty slot, we can create a constructor function that gives us a well-defined initial state for that thing. Let's say this is the component that needs to deal with our user's database. A constructor function gives us a single well-defined point that creates the initial state for that component. It also encapsulates the related state in a data structure. Could be a map, could be a record, could be any of Clojure's data structures really. Usually a map or a record is the most convenient. So now we have a single object that represents all the state we need to deal with this particular component, with this user's database. We can then define the functions and the operations in that interface in terms of that component, in terms of that data structure. We pass them in as arguments. And that makes the dependencies very clear. If we look at these functions, we can see immediately, okay, they are using this piece of state, this user database object. What is that? Well, I can look at the constructor. I could also have more elaborate assertions or checks to say what that thing is. This is very nice for testing. It means that if we want to test this thing, we just create it. And then we can call a function that uses it. And this guarantees that all of our tests are isolated. If each one is creating its own new piece of state and then using it, then we know that they're not going to affect each other. Another nice property about this is that when all we're defining is the functions to create the state and not defining the state itself, then that is safe to reload. So this code here can be safely reloaded without destroying any state that we already have built up. Now we still have to be careful. There are some other techniques, which I'll talk about later, that we can apply in order to ensure that the running state in our application actually matches the code that we have. But this is the first step. This is the thing we need, is this well-defined initial state in order to produce that. Another thing I see a lot of, and this just really drives me nuts. Uh, it was particularly prevalent in early versions of Clojure when every var was implicitly dynamic meaning everything could be rebound in a thread local context. Fortunately, that's no longer the case. Now you have to explicitly declare that you want something to be dynamically rebindable. But you still see a lot of instances of this pattern. There'll be some dynamic var which 
is the state of a resource, maybe a connection to something like a database, maybe some atom or ref holding some accumulated state, something that all of the functions in a given group are going to make use of. And this looks convenient. This says, oh, you know, I don't want to have to pass that thing in everywhere I want to use it. I just want it to be there. I just want it to be available all the time. So they make a thread-bound dynamic var. This kind of has some of the same problems, though, as the global var. This is a hidden dependency. If I have some function, you know, three or four layers out that is calling this op1 function here, how do I know that that has to be called in the context where resource is bound? I can only tell that by looking at the code or when I get an error. So we have a hidden dependency here, and we also have the same problems with managing that state. Now I have to know that I have to manage this state in my tests or anywhere else that I need to create it. So part of the temptation, I think, with using this pattern is that it's easy to write little macros that wrap around it, things like this. This is a very, very popular and, in my opinion, very misguided pattern in Clojure. It looks sensible. We're creating a macro that declares a scope in which some resource will be available. It binds that resource to a thread local var, then executes the body and ensures that the resource gets cleaned up when we're done. Now this is useful for some situations, which I'll point out, but it makes a lot of assumptions about how you're going to use that resource. The biggest one being, it assumes that whatever thing you're going to do with that resource, it's going to start and end on a single thread. Binding is thread local. That's how it's defined. So one of the first places you might run into this is if you return a lazy sequence from the body. This is something that tends to bite people a lot when they're starting out with closure, when they first do something that returns a lazy sequence, and they're like, why did it not work? Why did the thing close before I was finished using it? It's because it turns out this binding is something that's determined in time. And laziness is something that has indefinite time. You don't know when a lazy sequence is going to be realized. Also, there's no reason for a code, piece of code like this to assume that some operation is going to happen on a single thread. It might happen on another thread. It might dispatch to two or three other threads or agents or channels in core async. There are it's a, it's a pretty big assumption, in other words, to assume that whatever we're going to do with this resource can start and end on exactly one thread. Finally, and this is probably especially irritating if it's done in a reusable library, if this definition is structured this way, we are effectively limited to one instance of this resource at a time. If that resource is a database, well, we can only have one database active inside that with resource macro. So if we need to talk to two databases, we're kind of stuck. It's really awkward to have to set up one, do stuff, then set up the other one, do stuff, then maybe go back to the first one, and so on. It's a very awkward pattern to use. There is an alternative, which is closer to how closures with open macro actually works. And I think this is the thing that inspired a lot of these resource type macros. So the alternative is to use a local symbol. If you're going to create something like this, you can give the user the option of naming the symbol that's going to be binding the thing. And that symbol will be local and it will have lexical scope, just like all the other symbols in your program. So this has the advantage that it does not limit you to one instance of the resource. These are composable. If you are creating, if you're giving the user the opportunity to choose the symbol, then you can nest as many of these as you need and they'll all be accessible. But it still has built into it the assumption that the operation completes on a single thread. Now it's true, you might say, in versions of Clojure since 1.3, dynamic bindings will in some cases be conveyed to other threads. But that is a very tricky feature. I'm not even sure it was a good idea. And it's difficult to rely on because some of the threading operations will do that conveyance and some won't. So in general, I recommend just don't rely on it. Assume 
anywhere you call binding, what you're really creating there is a thread local. So an alternative to this is something that I like to call request scope or context scope. And that is to have your operations, your functions defined in terms of some data structure that represents and encapsulates all the state you need for that given operation. Now, the most common example of this is probably in a web app where you have a request. Although some of the dominant closure web frameworks assume that you have either a request or a response, but they don't allow you to carry around both at the same time. That's one problem, but you can pretty easily work around that. So assume that all of your functions are going to operate on some data structure that encapsulates all the state that they need. They don't need to reach out to other parts of the program. They don't need to touch global vars. They don't need to reach up the stack for dynamic binding. They just need the locals that they've been passed. This is sort of like making your functions more like pure functions, making them more referentially transparent even if the things that you're passing in here are actually stateful mutable things. Your program becomes easier to work with when they are all local. And you can then do things with this state. You can accumulate intermediate results. You can associate them into the context and return it on to the next part of the chain. You can acquire resources and then make them available to later functions in the chain. And if you want to do this, one trick you can do to make sure that they don't clash, because these things can go grow fairly large. And if you want several different functions, maybe in different namespaces, are all going to work on this one encapsulated context, they can use namespace qualified keys. This is a simple, easy way to allow many different parts of the code to share the same data structure, a map in this case, without conflicting with each other, without clashing. So the nice things about this pattern is that it's not confined to a single thread. An object like this, this encapsulated context, I can pass around anywhere I want. I can pass it off to another thread to be handled by a thread pool. I could store it somewhere temporarily to be picked up later as part of an asynchronous operation. I can put it on a channel using core async. There are lots of things I can do with this context that make the operation, the logical thread of control, not tied to the sort of physical aspects of the computation, like the call stack. Now, one downside to this is that we still need to manage this. If there are any stateful resources in this context, we still need some way to deal with them. So we have to make sure, for example, that if we open something at the beginning of processing this context, we have to do something to make sure it gets closed at the end. And I'll talk more about that too. So where can you actually use global vars? Where would it be a good idea to use a global var? I actually think the situations are very rare. There are true constants, things that never change. And those you can actually annotate in Clojure with this const metadata. That means that the compiler will inline them into the code. There are true singleton instances. Now remember, every time you def something, you are effectively creating a singleton. And I think true singletons are actually much rarer than we think, we are, than we think they are. So the only example I could come up with here is actually the system runtime, which is inescapably a singleton. The other place global vars are useful is when you're interacting with the application at the REPL. Lots of things you may want to def, because that's pretty much the only way you have to assign something a name that you can refer back to. So when you're working at the REPL, when you're interacting with your application, feel free to def anything that's useful. That will help you work with the application. Another pattern that I find useful is to take dynamic vars and use them only in contexts where I know that the operation I'm doing is confined to a single thread. A good example of this is something like a parser. A parser needs to keep track of a lot of state, and it's going to probably have a lot of recursive function calls. You may not want to have to pass all of that state on the stack everywhere. But you know 
that the beginning and end of your parsing operation is all going to happen on a single thread. So you can use a dynamically bound variable to do that. And it's even better if you make it private. So now I have some operation that I know is going to use this dynamic thread local state. I can bind that when I begin the operation, and I know it's going to be unbound by the time I finish the operation. And because I wrote this code, I know that this is not dispatching to any other threads. It's not returning a lazy sequence. It's not doing any of the things that would make a dynamic binding problematic. Another place where I've encountered this more recently is working with Java APIs that are single-threaded by definition. For example, the JMS, the Java Messaging API. All of the classes in JMS are defined to be not thread-safe. You have to create thread-local instances of all of them to use them. So I found it very useful to use dynamic bindings to hold them, because then I know that whatever instance I have, it is confined to the thread on which I'm currently using it. So next, decoupling. Decoupling is the idea that we can change parts of our application without actually modifying the code. Basically, it means identifying the boundaries between different parts of the system and then declaring, OK, this thing is over here, that thing is over there, and here is the interface between them. Here are the things that allow this to communicate with that. And if we control those things at the interface, then we have a way to insert maybe other implementations or alternate versions of one or the other of those components. So I have an example here, which I have to admit is not a great example, because I would probably never do this at the level of something as primitive as a database. I am not going to try to mock out an entire database in my application. But let's take this as an example for now. Let's say I have an application, and I know that I'm going to use a key value store for my data. I don't know which key value store. Maybe I do know, but it might change, whatever. So I know that I need three operations for my key value store, very simple operations. These are the primitives of my interface. These are what I have to make sure is available. Now once I've done that, I could define the public API that I'm going to use for this service in terms of those primitive operations. So notice the protocol here is a place where I can change things. It is not the place that is necessarily the public API for that component. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. So once I've built a public API on these primitive operations, I can define different versions of this component using different techniques. So say here I have a SQL database, and I've provided the implementations of those primitive methods so that I can just run my SQL, whatever, locally. And I have some state that I need to use to manage this connection, and I'll create that in a constructor function. So I'll provide a constructor function for my implementation of key value store using a SQL database. Then I might provide another implementation that has a different way of working. Here I've implemented those primitives just using closures, mutable reference types in memory. And then I provide a constructor for that, which creates its state locally every time I construct it. So now, I have two different versions of this data storage component. They're both using the same public API. They both use that, uh, what did I call it, the swap function that I showed earlier. That is defined in terms of the primitive API, and these different implementations only have to implement that primitive. Then I can define operations that use this service in terms of the component. So I pass that thing as an argument. My data storage component is an argument to the components that need to use it. And those components are only going to interact with it through its public API. They're only going to call the functions that I've specified or I've defined to be part of its API. In particular, they're not going to reach in to the details of that component. They're not going to look at any of its fields. 
Just because Clojure doesn't have private fields on records doesn't mean that we can't assume that those things should be private. So this, of course, is very easy to test. I can just create an instance of one of these things and use it in a test. And then I can look at the logic of an application, maybe leaving out some of the details, like the external resources or the databases, some of the other side affecting things that I don't need just to test the internal logic. Now, you have to be careful, because it's easy to go overboard with this, with this sort of technique. And I have noticed in myself a pattern of sometimes overusing this and falling into a habit of the kingdom of nouns. Anybody heard of this, this phrase? This was an article that uh, Steve Yegi wrote uh, a number of years ago talking about Java and languages like it and saying that everything has to be a noun and you have to build your entire application around nouns. So it's definitely easy to fall back into that habit, but it's pretty easy to notice when you're doing it. For example, if you have a closure protocol with just a single method in it, and then a bunch of records that are only implementing a single protocol, well, now it depends on your use case, but the odds are you don't actually need protocols or records there. All you really need are functions. An object that only implements one method is basically a function. But there is a trade-off here. The downside to functions is that you can't see inside them. Anytime you create a closure, you've created a totally opaque object. Now maybe in a Java debugger you could look in and find what the values of the fields are, but in general in closure the language we don't have any way of looking inside a closure to see what things are. This might be a problem for debugging or logging or something like that. So sometimes you have to compromise and create records anyway. Records have a nice property, that they're transparent. You can always look at them and inspect them. Even if you're not going to use that feature directly in the logic of your program, you can use it to debug or maybe play with your application at the REPL. Reify, of course, can give you many of the same capabilities as records, but like fun, Reify is opaque. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about, and that is the managed life cycle of components. Now, if you've uh, read other stuff that I've written about this, or if you've seen older versions of this talk, this is actually going to be a little bit different from those. I've figured out a few more things. I've realized a few things. So there will be some differences here from other places where you might have seen me talk about this. This is another common pattern that shows up in a lot of closure programs. We have a program and it does a bunch of stuff. And somewhere we need to get all that stuff running. So usually somewhere buried in some namespace there will be this function called init or start or bootstrap that starts everything up. And I call this rally the troops because all these functions end with exclamation marks because they're all side effects. You know, start the database, start the background, start the thread pool, do all these things. You know, these are all global side effects. So there's a lot of problems with this. I mean, it has the problems it's manipulating global mutable state, and we've seen why that's bad. The other thing is there might be some implicit ordering between these things. Maybe we need to do one of them before we can do the others. And there's nothing about the code itself that makes that obvious. So it's easy to get that wrong. And you have the same problem for each new version you want to do, whether it's testing or local development or production. You have to remember to get that ordering right. So I've come up with a very small framework to try to help manage these things. And I put it in this little library called Component. And the key piece of Component is this protocol called lifecycle. Lifecycle has two methods, start and stop. They both take a single argument, which is the component itself. Now this is the part that is actually a little bit different. I've presented versions of this protocol in other presentations and in other uh, blog articles. Um, this is slightly different from how I've presented it in the past. And I'll explain what that difference is in a second. So these two methods manage the life cycle of a component. The start operation does everything necessary to start the component running. It acquires external resources, 
which could be anything from a database connection to a thread pool to a file. And then it begins operating. It starts doing whatever it is that component does. Maybe that means starting an event loop. Maybe it means starting a web server. Whatever it is to start handling requests, that's what happens in the start method. Start also returns the component updated. And I'm going to talk more about that. The stop function just does the opposite. It stops operating. It releases any resources that this component might have acquired, closes the connections, closes the sockets, stop, stops responding to requests, and also returns the updated component. So each one of these methods behaves like a pure function. It's not a pure function in most cases. Usually these will have side effects. They're going to do something in the world. But they return the object that you pass them in. And so we can use closures, immutable data structures, to represent the components that we have. And I'll show some examples here. So here's my first example, probably the most common component I end up writing in real apps. This is a database. Who knows what database? But this is a component that represents my connection to the database that my application is going to use. And we can see it has some fields, and it implements the lifecycle protocol. And then in its start method, it does some side effect. It connects to the database, and then takes that state and associates it back into the component. Remember, closure records are just maps. So we can associate into them and return a new version of that component with its running state or its started state included. Stop does the same thing. In this case, stop is just a side effect. We shut down the connection, but we still have to return the component, even though we're not actually changing anything about it this time. Then we have to provide a constructor function, which is free of side effects. This is important. The constructor function just creates the structure in which to put this thing. All the side effects are confined to the start and stop methods. So now the nice thing about this is I have this thing that encapsulates all of the management of the state for my database. I can start it, I can stop it, I can interact with it, and it's all built around this single record. I can also make alternate versions of it. One thing I like to do in a lot of apps is have a database component that connects to my database, and then make another one that I use just for testing. Now I'm not going to go so far as to try to mock out an entire database implementation or provide stubs for every possible operation my database can do. That's far too much work. What I'm going to do is just provide an alternate implementation of the component that creates the database when I need it. It creates maybe some uniquely generated name using my local instance of whatever that database server is. So this is an alternate implementation that can set up a database for testing and then make sure it gets cleaned up when we're done. And I can use this in a test that needs to create that test database. Again, this is a convenient way to cleanly create, start, and tear down a piece of, of reusable state in every test for your application. So then, the next thing is I'll create components built around logical areas of functionality. And this is, this is the fuzziest concept, the hardest one to define. But generally, I will make components for each logical area of responsibility in an application. Now, at the bottom level, that might be dealing with a particular piece of external state, dealing with some external system, like a database or a message queuing system or a, a remote web-based API. But it could also be a group of related functionality, things that sort of logically go together. Now, in object-oriented languages, it's very typical to sort of put all this responsibility into data objects. You have an object representing a user or a product or whatever your domain object is, and it has methods on it that do stuff. In Clojure, I think really even in Java, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. That's just data. Individual instances of things, of information in your program, those are just data structures. But the piece of functionality as a whole, 
the thing that actually deals with all of those, that is a component. That has some state that we need to manage. So this example, this is a, a component that manages the API for our users, whatever our user objects are. Whatever database they're being stored in, I know that there are certain things that I will need to do related to users. And I'm going to encapsulate all that in this record and call it users API. So in the start method of this component, I can use other components. Notice one of the fields in users API is database. That's going to be an instance of the database component that I created earlier. So components can depend on other components. And in the start method, I can guarantee that the components I depend on have already been started. And I'll show how that works later. But I can do things. I can start running in this start method and do things that depend on other components already having been started. The final bit is this funny little function here, using. This is another function defined in my library that takes a map or a record, which is the component itself, and a collection of keys that identify the dependencies of that component by name. It doesn't say what they are. It doesn't say where they come from. All it says is their name, which is usually going to be a keyword. So this is a declaration that this component, this user's API component, depends on something called database and something called email service. And it'll be up to something else in the, in the application, which I'll show next, to actually provide those things to that component. Now all the using function actually does is just associate some metadata onto this object. That's why it works for records and maps. Anything that can have closure metadata on it can have this annotation on it to say what it depends on. So then when I'm defining the operations that make up that user's API, I define them in terms of the component, in terms of that piece of encapsulated state. So here's some action. I need to notify some user of some thing, and I, I want to send them a message. Well, I can pass that function, the, the component that it depends on, the user's API component. And then out of that, I can pull all the dependencies that I need. I know that the user's API was declared to depend on the database and the email service. And that means those are going to be available as keys in that record or map, and I can destructure them out. Then I can call other components via their public APIs. So my user's component contains some other components, and I can refer to them by calling their public functions. But notice what I didn't do. I didn't pull database and email service out of some other place. I didn't pull them out of a global var. I didn't pull them out of dynamic scope. I didn't you know, call some function that's going to get them for me. I already have them. They were part of the state that I got passed as the first argument to this function. So their local state that I'm referring to. So in order to tie all of this together, I need a way to tell the components where to get their dependencies. And I need something to provide those dependencies to them. So I do that with a thing I call a system. You could also call it a, an application or something else. But I call it a system, which is basically just a collection of components. In particular, it's a map. I use a function system map, which basically just creates an instance of a record. So it looks like an ordinary closure map. And I make a constructor function to produce it. And maybe it loads some configuration from a file. That's not important. Within that system, I associate components with names. And the names are just the keys in the map. So I know I have a user's API key. And I construct an instance of the user's API component to fill that slot. 
I have a database component. I construct an instance of the database component to fill that slot. And I have a few other components. I have my email service and my queue service, and I have constructors for each of those. Now, I'm assuming that each one of these functions here, each value in this map, is a component. It's something that has already declared its dependencies in metadata. Now, I could do that inline here when I construct the system. It doesn't matter where I associate that metadata in. I find it convenient to put it in the constructor for the component. So remember I said user's API. When I construct that, I declare that it depends on database and email service. It didn't say where they come from. It just said there has to be something named database and something named email service. So now what can I do with this? Well, system map is going to return a record. And that record has its own implementation of the lifecycle protocol, start and stop. But it's provided by the library. It's built in. In fact, that's basically all that system map does. So when I call start on a system, it does a bunch of things. The library, the implementation provided for the start method of a system will look at all the components in the system and look at their dependencies. Then it will build a graph of the dependencies of all the components in the system. So it will figure out, OK, I know uh, users depends on database and email. I know email depends on this API service. I know that depends on the queue service, and so on. And it will find all those relationships and then do a topological sort. It will take all the components and put them in some order such that the ones that don't depend on anything come first, and then the things that depend on them come later. Question? There could be duplication in name. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, however, I am assuming that this is all your code. This is not something that I expect libraries or you know, reusable tools to be doing. This is primarily an application development tool. So within system, we've called start on the system. It has a graph of all the components. It knows the dependency order. And then it's going to start each one in order. Now when it starts each one, here's what it's going to do. So say we're going to start this component here. Well, it's going to see what are the dependencies of this component. It knows that they've already been started because it sorted them into dependency order. So those things are already available in the map. And it's going to get them out of the system map and then associate them into the component. So that database that the user's API depends on, let's say database and email, the user's API depends on database and email. So we know that database and email are going to get started before users. So then it's going to get the database component and the email service component from the system map and associate them back into the user's API, which also, remember, is a map or a record in this case. Once we have done that, once we've injected those dependencies into the component, then we call start on it. This is how we know in that start method that the things the component depends on are already available. Now remember, the start and stop methods return an updated version of the component. So the system is going to take that started version of the component and associate it back into the system map. So what we end up with is a system that looks like exactly what we started with. It still has the same keys, and it still has all these components in it. But there's something different about it now. One, they've all been started. And two, each component has associated into it whatever subset of the system it depends on. That means that anything that the component needs is never more than one hop away. We're never going to have to reach through multiple layers of maps or records in order to get at some piece of state or functionality that we need. Anything a component needs should be one of its dependencies, and that means it's going to be available locally in the component. So this is a form 
of dependency injection. That's an old term, you know, it comes from the object-oriented programming world. And you can think about it, there are kind of, in, in object-oriented languages, there's generally two schools of thought for how you do dependency injection. One is that you only do it in constructors. So when you construct a component, it should be completely ready to go. And the other one is that you do it with setter methods. You actually go in and modify the state of something in order to inject its dependencies. This is kind of a hybrid. It's not exactly doing it with constructors because these constructors don't take their dependencies as arguments. But they're not really setters either. I'm not mutating anything. All of these are immutable data structures. And that, by the way, is actually the reason that it has to do two things at the same time. This is why start on a system has to do both starting all the components and associating in their dependencies. Because we need some way to ensure that the version of the component that we associate in as a dependency is the version that we got back when we started it. So that's why it works the way it does. And I should freely admit, it took me several years to figure this out, which is why I've talked about patterns similar to this that were slightly different. I've done versions where life cycle could actually mutate the objects, where there was some mutable state. So this has been a gradual evolution for me as well. But there are lots of neat things that you can do with this. One of them is you can create alternate versions of your system and then inject different versions of components. Remember the system is just a map, or a record in this case, but records behave like maps. So that means if I want to inject a different version of some dependency, all I have to do is call a SOS. I have to do that before I call start, because start is the thing that ties everything together. But before that, it's just a map. I can associate, I can swap in, I can do whatever I want with this map. And to answer the question you brought up earlier, another thing I can do, there's nothing special about the keys in this map. They could be ordinary keywords like this. They could be namespace qualified keywords. They could be they, really any data structure, strings, whatever you want to use as labels in your program. So if you have two different pieces of code that are going to create components with similar names, you might use namespace qualified keys to refer to them. So this works particularly well in conjunction with another set of patterns that I've developed for my own personal workflow. And this was an article I wrote last year called The Workflow Reloaded. And it's, there's a whole lot more to it. Basically, it's a way of working with an application interactively such that you can reload all of the code that has changed and ensure that the application you're running is consistent with the state of the source code on disk. It's built around another library I wrote called Tools Namespace and this function here called Refresh. The basic idea is that when you call Refresh, it will destroy and reload the namespaces for any files which you have changed on disk. And that's a way of ensuring that you're not just reevaluating all the forms in that file, but actually tearing it down and building it up again. This works very well with this component pattern, and I designed them to work together. So one thing we do, we typically put this in some development namespace. Maybe I like to use user because it's loaded automatically. You could also use something else, call it dev or whatever you want. And here we create a global var to represent the system. Now we're only going to use that in the REPL. This is just for interactive development. Then we provide some function that's going to create an instance of the system we want to develop and assign it to that global var. Then we call start on it. And then we have a function that can, in one step, stop the whole system. In other words, tear it all down, clear out all the state, close all of your database connections, reload any code that's changed, and then restart the system. There's some technical details of why I refer to that by a symbol name. Doesn't matter. The point is, I can have a single function, which I'll often bind to a key in my editor. I can run that function, and that will ensure that my application is exactly consistent with the source code. 
So I know I have, as soon as I run that, I have all the latest code, it matches what's on disk, and I have a clean application state to develop in. This is a really wonderful way to work with an, with an application uh, that you want to interact with. It does require some setup. You have to do some work, as we've seen, to make an application work with this style. But I found it a very effective way to work. In contrast to what I used to do, which is work on the system, manually reloading things for a while, and then when I'm ready to actually see if everything works, I restart the whole JVM process, which can take 10, 20, I've seen it even take 30 seconds to restart an application and reload all of the source code in a very large app. That's much slower than this process, which usually takes under a second. Another nice property of this is that I can look into the system. Remember I said the application code, you wouldn't normally want it to be reaching through multiple layers of maps or records to get at something. But for examining things at the REPL, it's great that I can do that. I can now reach any piece of state in the entire application by going through that global system object. And I just have to know the name of the component and the name of the piece of state that I want. So where does this all come together? We've got all of our nicely isolated, encapsulated components. We have a system that ties it all together. We still need to do one more thing, and that is we need to start it going. We need some place that is an entry point into our application where we kick off this whole process. Now the usual place to put this is in main, or whatever your application uses for main, whatever starts the world running. That's where you create your actual system, maybe insert some configuration data, and then start it. Unfortunately, there are a lot of situations, a lot of libraries and frameworks where you don't have control over main. And this is, I think, really unfortunate as just a sort of a, almost a side effect of how these frameworks and libraries have evolved. And it's one of the reasons that I dislike working with them, but it took me a long time to figure out why. And the reason is that they take away the main. They don't give you an entry point where you can construct things. The commonest version of this enclosure is in web apps where you define all of your routes and then wrap them in a bunch of, they're called middlewares, basically just wrapper functions that are going to modify something about the behavior of your web app. The problem with these things is that they're usually statically defined. We just def these things and then run them in some web server. We don't have any way to insert runtime state into this stack of nested functions. So instead, what I usually do to work around this is to create another component that represents the application itself. So one thing I don't do is try to take the whole system object, the original top level system, and pass it down through all the other functions. That ends up effectively being the same problem as global state, because everything can have access to everything. Instead, I take one component. I can call it app, or I can call it, you know, whatever I want to call it. It's the thing that encapsulates the application logic, the business logic, or whatever is going to be responding to my requests in my web app. Now, it might have dependencies on other components. It probably will have dependencies on a bunch of components. It might not have all of them, though. For example, if I have some component that's going to start up a background thread pool, well, the web app might not need to know about that in order to serve requests. It, but it, that might, might just need to be there as part of the system. So once I've created a component like this, I create some dynamically constructed middlewares and routes that actually insert that component into the request handling chain. And this, you know, I, I see this as basically a hack. It's a workaround. It's a way of getting some state back into uh, a framework that doesn't give you access to the main entry point. And really, the only key difference is that instead of defining that nested stack of functions in one place and making it static, I provide a function to construct it. And then when I start up a web server, 
I call this function, passing it in the web app component that I've constructed as part of my system. And so anything that needs to use the application context, it will be able to find it under some part of the request. This is why I would actually prefer to have a context that includes something more than just the, the web request. But most of the libraries for doing web stuff in Clojure just give you a single request object. But that's fine. It's a map. We can associate whatever we want into it. So here's the summary. I have basically just these ideas. Take your application, your big ball of mud, find the boundaries, find the places where you can separate different pieces of related functionality, and then encapsulate those things. Take the local state, group it together in a data structure, usually a record or a map, and then pass that state around. Decouple those components from each other by only allowing them to interact through a public, well-defined API, and then allow the, some other management, you could use my library, there are other libraries that do similar things, to inject the dependencies that that component needs. If you give each, li each component a managed lifecycle, then you have a clean way to manage all the state in your application, and you can compose all of this into a system. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the conference, or for a couple more hours at least. I'll be happy to answer some questions. And this is the library I talked about. You're welcome to pester me with questions on Twitter or IRC, where I'm usually around during business hours. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.